Hi. Good evening and thank you so much for spending the entire day with us. We are very grateful for your time and coming to join us here at the CEO Summit, the fifth edition of the Ghana CEO Summit. So much has been shared with us since we started today. So we'll go straight to our conversation for today. I won't beat about the bush. I'm going to call up my panelists uh, very quickly. And as they join me, please appreciate them as we go straight into our conversation. Let's call up Mr. Andrew Techi Apia, who's the CEO of ZP. Let's put our hands together for him as he joins us up here. Mr. Andrew Techi Apia. Right. Let's also welcome Mr. Jerry Parks. Mr. Jerry Parks is the CEO of Injaro Investments. Jerry is here with us. Yes, that's Jerry. Let's welcome Jerry as he comes up to join us. Right, we also have Mr. Mohamedou Muzamil, who's the country director for Ecom Ghana. Let's appreciate him as he joins us up here. And our final panelist for this afternoon, Mr. Matthew Corey, who's the CEO of HMD Ghana. Let's also appreciate Mr. Corey as he joins us. Yeah, we'll just do this very quickly. We'll just ask that we just share very brief introductions ourselves and the companies that we represent. And once we're done that, we go straight into the question time. So maybe I'll start from my extreme left. Mr. Techi, introduce yourself and then the company that you represent. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew. I usually get very intimidated and shy by too many people. Forgive me. So I work for a company called ZPay. And for those of you who don't know about us, we've been around for about seven years. And we specialize in paying remittances into mobile wallets across Africa. Um, Romeo, the colleague who was here before, talked about the fact that remittances go to the villages. is because of us. Um, a few different conversations I've been listening to all day. And um, in Ghana, we have licensed mobile money. In some of African countries, we have approved and authorized by Central Bank to terminate remittances. In some parts of Africa, to have mobile money. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yes, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jerry Parks, co founder of Injaro Investments. Um, Injaro is a private capital manager. We um, raise capital from institutions, local and international, and then we in turn invest that money in small to medium sized businesses across Africa. We've been doing this for around a decade and we currently are responsible for managing over 60 million US dollars. We've put about 35 million dollars to work in, in several companies, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, and obviously Ghana, Ghana as well. Um, we, we are driven by the, the vision of trying to build sustainable businesses that drive social and economic value in Africa. And that is the, the guiding light really behind what we do. So um, hopefully I'll get to speak a bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. Um, Mr. Muzamil. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Muzamil. I'm the country director for Ecom Ghana. Ecom is a Swiss uh, multinational, which is uh, operational since 1849, so long, long time ago. In Ghana, we are present for the last 22 years, and uh, we're quite different from the rest of the panelists. We say that we are in the business of rural prosperity, and we have multiple companies in the agricultural space. Uh, we have uh, a large presence in the cocoa value chain. Uh, we have a logistic company, warehousing company, we are in the cashew value chain, we are into agrochemicals, agro-machinery, and also uh, building some uh, tech space uh, powered uh, businesses like uh, creating rural markets. Um, so uh, quite a lot that we can catch up on, on, on things that has changed for us uh, due to the uh, intervention of uh, digital systems you know, over the course of the time. Right, thank you. I'm sure that you'll be willing to share a lot more with us when we get into the detail of this conversation, but we just do a quick introduction for Mr. Corey also, HMD Ghana. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us. And my name is Matthew Corey. I'm the founder and CEO of Heavy uh, Machinery Leadership. Uh, we're established in Ghana, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, and Guinea Conakry. We provide machinery and equipment solutions for infrastructure mining, agriculture, and recycling and waste management. 
uh, equipment mainly we sell equipment we provide after sales support um, uh, data analytics in the form of telematics and smart reporting for all the industries that I mentioned. Um, we've been in data for eight years and uh, thank you for having us today. Right, thank you so much. So very quickly, this session is going to be slightly different. We're going to be going into the actual stories and experiences of the companies which are represented here. The sub-theme for our conversation, if you like, would be radically transforming our businesses to become African multinationals, radically transforming our businesses. Now, obviously, I always say that life is too short to make all the mistakes ourselves, so we learn from other people's experiences. Someone has done this before. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We're going to be listening to your stories, how you got to where you are now. Obviously, Flovis is here, work in more than one country, so your businesses transcend various borders. I'll start with you, Jerry. I mean, you are present in over five um, African countries. You started naturally from somewhere, private equity firm, got funding, worked through places, supported businesses. Your focus is in the area of SMEs and other small business, um, medium scale enterprise areas, helping people to set up their businesses. So what one thing would you say, for example, in your journey here, would you say significantly has been a challenge for building your company to where it is now? I'm saying this because we want to learn from their real life experience. What one significant challenge? I leave that to you. I could, it could be tech, it could be digital, it could be recruitment, it could be cultural diversity, it could be logistics and transport. You choose the one that you think has been most challenging so that we can learn from the experience that you have. Great. Um, I think probably I'll touch on the challenge and probably also um, expand a little bit on, on, the, on the story. I would say that for, um, I'd say Andrew and I fall into the category of the homegrown multinational. And I would probably not be too far wrong in saying that the biggest challenge we have is getting the market to believe in us, being a homegrown talent seeking to build a multinational business. Many people look at you and say your dream is too big. Um, why do you think you can do it when um, the only other people doing this are large multinationals? So if there's one challenge, it is actually getting over the hurdle and getting those first few clients, that first investor, you know, the, the, the first important partner to believe in you and say, you know what, I'm going to give you a chance. That is the big, the big challenge. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about, in terms of the journey, what got us over here, the first thing is, is having a big, scary vision and you have to write it down. Uh, you know, you've got to write it down, even if you forget it, the power of the written down goal is something you cannot um, underestimate. We at Injaro, I accidentally came across some goals I had written 10 years prior, and I was surprised, because I'd forgotten I'd written down those goals, but I looked at what I had written down, and what I had achieved at that point is exactly what I had written. So I'm really trying to speak to my fellow aspiring homegrown multinationals. Please write down that big, write down that big goal, and that is a, a very good start. Next thing, if you want to be a multinational from day one, start putting in place the systems that you need as a multinational. Um, in Jaro, we had two co-founders, myself and another person. But on day one, we put in place systems and processes that assumed that we had people in several African countries. We, we, we made sure we got the right cloud systems. We put in place a system that made it possible to work from home 10 years ago. When Corona happened, we didn't have to change anything at all. We just slid very smoothly into working from home, work, working from different countries. We hired two people during the pandemic who we had never seen before, one in Senegal, one in Kenya. Because from day one, we started thinking we are multinational, we need to put the systems in place. Um, the third thing is about the people. If you want to be multinational, you need to have a multinational team. To the extent possible, at least think about how you integrate a multinational team. And, you know, this means from day one, you need to be, if you go to a conference like this and there are people who are not from your country, reach out to them, talk to them. You never know which contact could become a partner later on. If you have the good fortune of studying abroad, make friends, talk to people from other African countries or other people who are interested in Africa. You never know which one of those contacts can become a future, a future business partner. You know, the people point, I'll say it's also very important to develop people, consciously really, try to say to yourself, 
Ghana has a lot of talented people, or there are a lot of talented people in Africa. I'm going to find the most talented. I'm going to develop them. So in developing them, I can develop my my my, my business. Um, then I would say the, the next one would be around setting high standards. Um, my fellow Ghanaians, we, we know, you, you probably know where I'm going with this. The, the, the whole attitude of Anyeshe, um, Pamanyami, it doesn't matter, give it to God. If you're trying to build a multinational, remember, your competition is international. So right from day one, set those high standards. Make people see your output as an African or a Ghanaian company and say, wow, was this thing done in Ghana? Was this thing done in Africa? And you should be able to respond to them, why not? Why can't this be done in Africa or Ghana? Set those really high standards. Um, final, final point, and I'm sorry if I've taken up a bit more airtime, is for the, your core business model, I think you should really be trying to tap into growth. Tap into something that is helping other people. Tap into something that is solving a big problem. Very good example of this is ZPay. But there's so many other potential examples. If you tap into something that you're passionate about, that is also solving other people's problems, eventually you will see the type of growth. And if you've done all the other things, I think you will be able to create or restructure your business into um, an African multinational. Thank you. Right. You know, as you spoke, you spoke about growth, you spoke about doing something that solves problems, that fixes situations. People go into business for different reasons. Now we've seen the conversation from your perspective as Injaro. You're a private equity firm, you put money on the table, you help companies to be able to set up and do things that they set out to do. What would make a company listening to us this afternoon, who wants to be like Injaro, who's putting themselves out in a place to be funded by a company like yours, what would make them take all the boxes or not take all the boxes? I think what would make them tick all the boxes is having uh, an alignment in vision and approach. Because when we're investing in a company, we, we don't look at it like um, probably other financial institutions do, which is we are giving you money and you pay us back money um, at some point in the future. We ask ourselves, I look at it this way, we are taking money from an institution, we're putting it to work to generate a return and return the money to those investors. And I'm part of a team that is supposed to be generating the return on that money. But the other part of the team is a company I'm going to invest in. So the first question we are asking ourselves is, does this company, the people in this company, do they represent the type of people that we think we can work with as partners to, towards um, an ambitious objective? Very, very first question. If we cannot satisfy ourselves, our gut tells us that this doesn't quite feel right, then we probably will not even continue the conversation, even if everything else looks good. Uh, some of this we've learned through hard experience. And the second thing is you must have a plan. You know, you must have a destination that you're going towards because our job is to support you in achieving your plan. Nothing will motivate any company more than the plan that they have for themselves. So once we also believe in that plan, all we'll do is help you reach that goal. Um, no, any entrepreneur will tell you that an idea that comes from someone else is not the thing that motivates them. So we really want to see that they have a plan for themselves. And other than that, I'd say the alignment of values, like believing in developing people, believing in having high integrity, delivering high quality products to the market, not using the excuse at all. We, we are in Ghana, we have infrastructure challenges, so we can't do this. That is that kind of positive mindset and that uh, willingness to, to deliver. Um, the people will not raise money from us. Um, this is a free tip. If I ask you what are your challenges and you say, oh, my only challenge is the money. Once we have the money, everything is sorted. Um, chances are you will not raise money from us. <laughs> Thank you. Right, I'm happy you, you talk about that. So the very final question to you in this, in this round of questions. You've talked to us about how various companies who are looking for funding from companies like yours can tick all the boxes. What's the one area that ranks highest in your assessment of companies that require funding where they fail? Which one area do they feel most to qualify? Of course, the first area is when they say, I'll give you a bonus all we need is the I'll money, but beyond that. <laughs> So the, 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 the biggest one is um, a track record of sound historical financial management. And this is, it's not deliberate, it's just that I think culturally we do not have the, the habit of keeping financial records, especially if it's a business that you open for yourself and for your family um, and you don't have any outsiders in there, right? Um, but I would say maybe the second thing is integrity because I think what a lot of people in our environment do not seem to realize is that um, smart investors do not necessarily always look for, you know, 
They, they look for diamonds in the rough sometimes. So you have a company that may have had some problems in the past, but they try to recast their historical performance like it never made a mistake before, everything has been perfect, which is, as a fellow entrepreneur in the ecosystem, is very hard for me to believe. Because we have also gone through problems. You've had some good years, you've had some bad years. So I think the second thing is people try to um, window dress, over window dress their past and make it look like they've never had any challenges. And that can make an investor a little nervous actually. Have some integrity and have good, fine, sound financial management also. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to you very briefly, but I want to go very quickly to Mr. Techi up here. You are the CEO of ZP, and obviously your, your company, amongst other things, provides connectivity for digital channels through wallets, ATMs, banks, bank accounts, digital tokens, and cards. And the list goes on and on. The argument has been made here today, and even more so by the presentation by MPS when they spoke about the role of digitization, and the vice president also spoke about it. So the argument for digitization, I'd say, is strong today. Regardless, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the inclusion of digitization in the strategy of any company today that wants to be an African multinational. Suffice it to say that you are already there. You're already a multinational in, in your own respect. You're, a, you're an enabler. So tell us how digitization helped you get where you are and how it can also be relevant to any company that may not necessarily be an enabler, but in any other field of endeavor, how digitization plays a strong role for them also. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take it from two angles. The angle that says that those who want to start and the angle of those of us who have started. But before that, I also want to bring it to the 21st century. So, you know, we have the super apps, we have the super platforms, Facebook, Twitter, etc. These are all multinationals, but they are not necessarily in every geography. They actually participate in other geographies. Some of them 100, 200, some of them 3, 4, 5. And this is as a simple result of technology, digitalization. So you need to first see it from that angle. So as a, as, as a new player coming into a space, and, and I agree with Jerry, you must seek to solve a problem. The best companies are those who solve a problem. That's why Procter & Gamble is still around. That's why Johnny Walker is still around. And that's what we're going to be around for. Work. So first seek to solve a problem. Once you've identified the problem you're going to solve, then the next thing is ask yourself, do you necessarily have to be in that market? I mean, I have a very active business in about 13 countries. I've never been to Cameroon for business, but it's my fourth largest market. I, I haven't been to Ivory Coast until the pandemic eased down this year, and it's my second largest market. And I'm talking about millions of dollars market. It, it's, it's really a function of understanding the play. Okay, then sometimes regulatory will require you to have certain presence because some markets, based on the regulatory play, you might want to have a presence or be able to play the markets from one single market. So that also is a factor you must consider. But beyond that conversation, from an enabling digitalization perspective, which is a question you're asking, once you've identified a problem you want to solve, I think what that's what we did was we said, okay, look, because we want to be here, and want to scale by it. So, so we're going to set some parameters. So for Ghana, we said we're going to build a playbook. That playbook should have about 20 different things we must achieve and do it very well. Once we understand that, we'll be able to take that playbook to another market. Um, one, obviously, because we're FinTech, transactions would always be key. So we said, well, look, once we hit 400,000 transactions in a month, we're going to move out. Because if we don't move out quickly, scale will become a problem. Because economies of scale, all markets will scale like water, they'll find their level. But sometimes some markets will find it rapidly, some markets will find it steady. So when you reach a certain cost, which for us was that 400,000, then we must be able to multiply ourselves to multiple markets. To do that, you must institutionalize policies and procedures. Almost like a prisoner, you, you, it must be a way of life. If it's a way of life, then it's easier to take it to the next market. So it's like a grenade. You walk into Nigeria, you throw it in, it's a playbook, things unfold, your policies, your procedures, your programs, etc. Jerry talked about market acceptance, I like that. Market acceptance is the most difficult thing, so what you do is you go with partnerships. Whatever problem you're seeking to solve in the world, it's a partner on the other side. And the chances are that partner is in this playbook with you. So you do that. Then the, the thing is, because we're in Little Africa, a lot of time we don't want to take the risk because we're not sure because we've been told so many stories, etc. 
I, I, I like what I, what I would tell every entrepreneur in the room is go into the market, feel it out, but be data driven. Data driven meaning that understand what plays in that market. So in our ecosystem, we know that the market is a $70 billion market in Africa. So by our geography, we know, okay, by behaviors, this is culture. What are the similar cultures to our culture in Ghana? What are the similar behaviors to maybe the other markets we've been in? And we also look for people with market experience. We recruit them deliberately. We, we make sure we have work permits for people in Ghana so that when we're on the other side, we'll go by the same culture. So we almost, we almost throw money away to make money again when the time is right. And you do this so that when you walk into the market and you fill the market, you attack it. Sometimes you look for a player who wants to sell, you buy into it, or you start Greenfield. The most difficult opportunity is a Greenfield, but it's almost some of the, it's the easiest in time. The question is if you have the patience. If you don't have people like Jerry as investors on your back, you probably do Greenfield. If you have investors, you buy whatever you can buy and fix it. But it's, I, I think a lot of time also, we don't have an open mind. So we, we, we prejudge ourselves before we go out there. You know, the Chinese have a problem. I right? will not be able to paraphrase it the way they do it. But basically, what they are saying in simple terms is if you're, going, if you're going to go onto the other side and you meet a lion, don't waste time killing the lion. Just jump on the back of the lion and go. When you get on the other side, you and the lion will figure it out. A lot of time, we want to kill the lion before we go. By the time we finish killing the lion, there's 10 years down the road. That's what's happening to a lot of companies in Ghana. So they never branched out. Do you see what I mean? They are still, still killing the lion before they branch out. Not forgetting that maybe if they jump on the lions back and went, they'll win on the other side. So it comes back to risk. Be ready to take risk as well. And risk is a function of reward, or reward is a function of risk. So if you do that, then I think the last thing is you need to build friends. You need to build an ecosystem of friends. Because you need them. You need to be humble about it. You need to be able to agree. I, I, I almost beg to say that you must almost be the most humble person in the room and appreciate cultures when you get on the other side. Because it's such a sensitive thing. You could be laughing, you could be sneezing, but your sneeze is considered very derogatory or very offensive to the guy next door. I, I think I've said a lot. You know, you know that Chinese proverb you just shared brings two words to my mind, collaboration and partnership. Now, I remember two years ago when we had this conversation here, it came out very strongly that one of the reasons why African companies or companies which start out to become multinationals here in Africa are unable to achieve this aim is because sometimes we try to do it all by ourselves. You have had some collaborations, some relevant partnerships with other corporates and also with individuals. Share with us what your experience has been and make a strong argument, if you will, for anyone listening to us on the value of collaborations and partnerships in becoming an African multinational or a multinational for that matter. Well, look, I, I think for me, partnerships and collaboration, I can't even value it. It's, 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 it's worth billions of dollars. And I'll start by this. So when we started operations, we wanted to be in England. So we're actually in England. We're regulated by the FCA. We have an office right down the hill of the city of London, on Stamford Street. And initially, what we did was we actually spoke to a local company that had a license and said, you know what, we want to go into the UK. Can we use your license as an operator? So that's collaboration. We were willing to share whatever we will earn with somebody else. Three, four years down the road, we come back and buy the full license back. Literally paid for the, pay the company and bought their company back from them. So that's the first layer of collaboration. The second thing is that I also think that a lot of time, the concept of having it all for ourselves, it doesn't work. I, I have a simple theory. I say, look, a group of people come together, put their money together and become rich. And when they come together, they are building an ecosystem. So that ecosystem means that you might benefit from the tie you're wearing, but I might benefit from the sound of the, of the mic. Others might benefit from other things, but it means we're going to make money together. If that's the spirit, then let's not go into a, a collaboration where I must make premium. I must be willing to make lesser than premium so that everybody makes money in the value chain. So that's another thing we've done with our partnerships. We've had partnerships that 
paid us very little money, but we got a lot of results for them, and out of them we will grow. There are partnerships that paid us premium, and we still grew. And what, what I would always say, is, and this is to every, every industry, the key thing, if you're going to go the partnership model, is that you must have a consciousness for compliance, service delivery, and technology. So technology is actually an offense. Compliance means you're working on integrity, you're working by the book, you're working tight and narrow. Service delivery means you're willing to be up 24 hours to make sure your partner is happy. Then the technology will enable the two. So that's another mindset you gotta go with, and that's what we did. Just by going with that, we enriched our portfolio overnight. Overnight, we had tons of customers. I mean, gone are the days when we go looking for customers. For two years, we just had one client, and yet we grew. Jonathan from Austec, who stood here a few minutes ago, sat here. I remember five years ago, his team were going to shut us down, and I had to beg him. He was in London. I begged him and begged him, and he said, listen, Andrew, I've been here before. I'm going to give you guys a chance. Today we're here, we're buying companies. So it's about collaboration, right? It's about what we're also willing to give Jonathan at the time for him to bet the stake on us that we'll get there. I, I, I think that we cannot even under, be, believe the argument about collaboration and partnership. To be able to get that, you must have a perfect outfit. Perfect outfit doesn't mean that you look perfect, but it means that you seem to be wanting to do the right thing. Um, I remember we had these contracts that said clients had the right of auditing our business. Those days it was a very hard thing to chew as an entrepreneur because anybody can walk in to come and audit your business. But guess what? We're here because of that. So it's really, if you're going to go that way, then you must be willing to also sacrifice. And in these sacrifices, you'll be amazed what you get out of it. And you'll get growth. And they'll go with you into market. Sometimes they'll even open opportunities for you. Interesting points you make there. Mr. Corey, I'd like to hear your thoughts also. Um, you are also a multinational HMD Ghana, and obviously you um, heavy machinery dealership. I'd like to find out, before I go into your question of logistics, still on the same conversation of partnerships and collaborations, but this time, let's dovetail a bit into the value chain that that creates in the local economies where you're present. So what has been your experience with the various partnerships in the local economies that you've operated? And what are the value chains or value propositions that have been created in that process, if you like? Well, very important uh, and, uh, topic that needs a deep dive. But I agree with my fellow CEO that uh, his approach to partnership. Uh, I think the most important thing, uh, partnerships are essential for any, for any business to grow, whether locally, regionally, or pan-African. Uh, it's uh, very important for accelerating growth. Uh, what I think is the most important thing for the success of the partnership is to align the incentives. That's, that's Hello? Yeah. In my experience, is the most important thing because partnerships involve several parties, uh, external, internal to the value chain. Uh, uh, and if the incentives are not aligned, if we don't, uh, we don't come out all winners, uh, it's difficult for partnerships to work. Uh, this is something we've encountered a lot. We work with uh, uh, international suppliers, people who distribute equipment in, uh, across West Africa. The problem that we face with uh, such companies is they don't understand the culture, they don't understand how it functions, they don't understand the value. Uh, and it's difficult to uh, uh, portray what happens on the ground. Uh, what we try to do is try, try to bridge the gap in the, in, the, uh, in the incentives and we try to have our uh, partners that are from abroad engage the market, understand it better, we accompany them, we sort of educate them uh, about how the best ways to do it uh, and eventually achieve to a win-win uh, scenario. So again, I would say making sure that the incentives are aligned for all parties. 
Right. And I'm also interested in finding out from you again, Mr. Corey, the aspect of digitization. Now, when we make the argument for digitization, it's a great thing. It's going to help businesses to grow. But there's also the, the other side, which sometimes we're worried about, but the IT guys tell us not to worry about, which is the area of cybercrime and, and cybersecurity. I, I spent a bit of time speaking with the head of CID, um, Dr. Gustav Yangsen, and he tells us that there's an upsurge in cybercrime here in Ghana using digitization to achieve the growth that we expect. What would you say, for example, that a multinational should look at in terms of mitigating some of the risks that Andrew talks about in the area of digitization? I know there's cyber insurance, I know there's, there's uh, firewalls, investment in technology and all of that, but bringing it down to your specific experience, what, have you had any challenges in this space and how have you handled it? specific with cyber security or digitization as well. Well, digitization and in that process, have you had any incidents of cyber security? Uh, you've had to mitigate very the little experience with cyber security, but digitization quite a lot because our industry is transforming. Uh, what's happening in our industry is we are changing from a, what we call a traditional distributor to more of a commoditized trader. And in order to make that leap, that switch, it's very important that you incorporate a digital solution or digitize a part of your value chain possibly all of it. So for our industry, it's critical. It's actually existential for us to know. Our biggest threat in the industry is the Chinese. Chinese is, uh, well, it's, there's, there's no uh, secrets about the strategies. It's, they utilize it simply dumping and gaining market share as quickly as possible. And to counter that, uh, for companies that are trying to provide value-added services, it's very difficult. So the solution is simply digitizing uh, a considerable part of your value chain. Uh, what we've done uh, internally in our organization is basically trying to mystify the digital aspect of our business. Uh, sorry for the words, but to dumb it down a little bit, uh, especially in the field of analytics. Uh, basically, we collect a lot of data from the machinery that's out there. We analyze it. Uh, we, uh, we prescribe solutions based on this data. Um, it's very difficult to make your average user understand what it's about. There's too much data. Hello? What we try to do is what we have done internally is build smart reports. And I'm going to use to an oxymoron here or uh, contradicting words. Smart reports for dummies, basically, based to educate the user on the basic steps of digitization and how to adopt the technology and create value within their own value chain. Uh, our industry, again, I say it's existential to digitize. It's very, very important. And I don't think within 15 years time, if we don't adopt technology uh, quickly, the industry will be overtaken by, uh, unfortunately, by Chinese, which are actually improving quality without uh, uh, discrediting the uh, the uh, equipment or the solutions they provide, they're actually learning and improving and getting better. So uh, uh, digitization for me, again, uh, is very important, but uh, it's not the objective. I think it's the uh, attack, depending on uh, what we're trying to achieve. What I believe is to innovate, and not to, in to innovate, to understand the, the industry you're in, build a competitive advantage and if digitization is uh, an imperative in your innovation strategy then so be it you adopt it but sometimes it's not necessary uh, if you're selling machines or but a big part of it is still traditional so it's not really necessary for us to digitize the actual execution or the last mile what we call in the after sales delivery so what's more important for me is and it's it's, it's the theme of this event I know and I don't want to undermine that, but I think digitization follows uh, an explicit, explicit strategy to innovate. And where you see the need to digitize, accelerate the digitization, you do it. So for me, innovation, and that's something I can talk uh, a lot about, is the most important thing to think about and to make it as an explicit, explicit strategy uh, or uh, build it, uh, institutionalize it in your organization, not only in words, but in terms of budget, in terms of symbols, in terms of uh, artifacts, in terms of your company statements, uh, just basically walk the walk when you innovate, empower people, provide them an opportunity 
to uh, discover, to make mistakes, not to be punished for them, and have them innovate and cascade it from the top down across your organization, separate uh, the deliver the discovery, which are the innovator skills, from the from the delivery skills. There's a process to it. It's very simple, actually. Uh, all it requires is courage and leadership. And if digitization is an imperative, as I said, in creating the value, then you need to adopt it very quickly. You talk, you talk about leadership, and it brings me to the area of corporate governance, which is also a very interesting aspect of growth for companies that, that wish to become like yours. A few years ago, here in this country, the issue of corporate governance became major conversation to the extent that we actually have a new act the, uh, the New Companies Act, which has been revised to include um, certain things that will strengthen our corporate governance aspect. With your company, what, what would you say are the strongest points you would recommend for anyone listening to us vis-a-vis -vis corporate governance in the structures that they set up, both internationally and in, in the local areas as well? I'll touch on one of uh, Jerry's points. I think it's uh, mentioned. Uh, culture, I would say philosophy, uh, building a strong uh, entrepreneurial and uh, corporate philosophy. And by philosophy, I mean uh, partly structure, partly culture, uh, investing in the structure part, which is systems and operating procedures, and culture is, uh, is the way we do it, and building a culture of change. Uh, I think the spirit is is very strong in Africa, it simply needs to be empowered. So I would focus again, I think, where we have a weakness is the structure side in order to have this coherent, complete philosophy to enable uh, small companies to become medium and medium companies to grow. And I think this is, this is an area that government should focus on because government is a strong enabler uh, for building strong structure in companies. They provide solutions, channels, touch points, education programs, and so on. Right. I'm coming to you, Mr. Um, Muzamil. You know, one of the things that you hear oftentimes in, in business parlance and conversation is that for multinationals, you think globally, but act locally. So, for example, if you started, let's say, in England, like your company, Andrew, when you go to a local area, it's absolutely important to take into cognizance some of the exigencies and diversities that exist within the local context in order for your business to survive. Essentially, because you're working with individuals and human beings. Expanding into Africa and into Ghana, for example, what has your specific experience been and what would you say towards that conversation on thinking globally and acting locally vis-a-vis -vis cultural diversities and exigencies towards the agenda of growing a company to become a multinational? Good question, Yao. Uh, for us, historically, e-com has been a commodity merchant and we largely dealt with sourcing commodities and exporting them internationally and that was the, the core essential business. So it, it didn't really have much digital touch to, to it except for the fact that the commodities were traded in the international markets. Now as the years progress we, we felt that there needs to be change. Like you said, okay, you have to adapt to the local context. So back in 2016, we were already 15 years into Africa, or into Ghana particularly, and we were still focusing on the classic business of buying and selling cocoa. Of course, it was a large business. It was $300 million turnover at that time already because we were a significant market player. But this business was, was almost dying. So it was time for us to understand the local conditions and innovate. So uh, why we said that the business was dying, particularly because of the margin pressure, as we all know, Cocoa is regulated by the government. Um, Cocoa Board regulates the margins that we operate with. Uh, so if we historically look at our margin trend, over the last five years, our margins have dropped by over 40%. This is gross margins, and these margins are fixed. So the only way we can actually operate is have cost efficiency. And there are very few commodity companies who can actually achieve an efficiency of 40% and be sustainable, which pushed us to innovate. So uh, there comes the play of understanding the local context and using our local Ghanaian leadership to pitch in. To we, we set up an innovation hub, understood what would be our new purpose. Are we now a commodity merchant or we are going to do something else? We came up with this theme of 
creating rural prosperity. And we identified how agriculture in that space is transformed globally. So globally, agriculture got transformed through effective use of a few pillars. One is imparting knowledge, um, importing technology, creating access to market and financial inclusion. So we started working on each of these pillars uh, to enable our farmers and those of more than 10,000 uh, direct indirect value chain agents to, to create new businesses and innovate with us as micro entrepreneurs. So we began uh, a business of selling agro input based on the client's demand. So obviously it's a controlled market so you, you go through the regulation processes but then again you understand the farmer's requirement and we wanted to do this digitally. So it's not just about opening up a shop and selling it to the farmer but then map out the farmer's yields, production data, what can he actually afford. So we have this digital database of over 200,000 farmers, what they produce, what their capacities are and based on that capacity we decided to give them inputs on credit during the period where they actually wanted the inputs. So that database helped us. Uh, then again on the, on the digital innovation, especially on one business which was having efficiency crunches, that is the cocoa business, in order to create efficiency, I mean we were really living in the dinosaur era because uh, we had warehouses across 190 uh, cocoa growing districts and connectivity was a major issue. So almost all documentation was physical where people would carry this documentation to the head office in Kumasi or Accra once a week and most of the data was not reported or misreported and would be the end of the year or you know your review cycle or audit cycle by the time you would figure out these challenges. So uh, it was an interesting era over the course of three years with continuous education, with continuous software and bug development going into USSD and a whole lot of other host of technologies, improving connectivity by giving Wi-Fi, increasing bandwidth at local areas, even trying to create some kind of satellite connectivity in order to make all our transactions live. And today I'm proud to say that, you know, with the help of this digital uh, efficiency transformation, we have reduced our field losses to the extent of 90% over the course of the last three years. So that's really a, a, you know, a big plus of you know, adopting digital uh, methods to agriculture. Now, not only that, one of the other areas that we ventured into in terms of local innovation was that we identified that uh, a large portion of Ghana's uh, farmer base is made up of smallholder farmers. I mean, smallholder farmers are basically farmers who have around two hectares of land as what's operational. Most of these farmers are classified as sustenance farmers. So basically they just grow to either consume or just make enough to sell. Like say for example, if it's a cocoa farmer sell enough to, to raise cash to feed himself. So they did not think of it as a business. So in order for them to think of it as a business and in order to create the agricultural revolution, we decided to enable them in terms of the areas where they are lacking. So that's, uh, our farmer is about 55 years old, so we try to, the average farmer age, so we try to create micro machinery that supports the farmer to increase his yield and his output, which makes his life easier. So even in the case of micro machinery, we look at what works for the farmer. Say for example, we introduce um, a maize thrasher, and maize is a big popular crop in Ghana. The maize thrasher came with an electric motor. And this was our initial concept, okay, it's going to help the farmer. But ultimately we realized that they were thrashing the maize in the farms and the electric motor doesn't work. So you take the feedback, you go back and then you create a maize thrasher with a diesel engine. And in order to make it more digital, what we are trying to do at the moment is to have all the service data and records completely digitized. So once you own the machine, your serial number is recorded with us. Every service request can be raised digitally. There can be a call center that can assist you through the process as well. And there's continuous training because training the farmer how to use um, a service digitally also requires quite a bit of investment for which we are working with again international partners who understand our costs and who are able to uh, support us in this endeavor. 
So it's quite a lot going on here. This is Big Brother. Mr. Moderator, you have five minutes to engage your partner. Right, okay, thank you very much. You know, I noticed Andrew was looking at you very keenly when you spoke about losses in the field, but I noticed he breathed a sigh of relief when you got to that point where you spoke about 90% um, success in that field. Talking about data and strategy, um, Jerry, I'm coming to you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come to you next, Andrew. Data supports a lot of things you do and who you choose to support and what business field they're in and all of that. You've just spoken about digitization, cultural diversity, and all of that. Different strategies work in different areas and different, let's say, fields of endeavor. Someone is listening to us today, they want to set up a company 10 years from now, they want to become a multinational. What are the areas that have the highest success rates in terms of growth in the, in the companies you've supported so far, funding? Um, that's actually a quite a hard question to answer if you're looking at it in terms of sectors, because the, the actual success factors are more to do with the, the software, the human capital, um, actually than it is with the, with the sector. Because, I mean, you could even look at the sector that ZPay is in seven years ago, and you could say, very, very challenging. You're probably not bet in favor of a ZPay. But uh, I'd hazard a guess and say that the human capital that they have over there and the, the, you know, the software that they built, the, the culture that they built, is what has enabled them to, to get over there. Obviously, there's some sectors which would be harder to succeed in than, than others. And actually, if you're looking to make a huge financial return, investing in the primary production side of agriculture is probably one of the tougher ones, except if you're looking at the cash crop setting. Um, but since we're talking about the areas that work, I think if you're aggregating crops, if you're providing services that are based on digital infrastructure, where you do not have a huge asset um, requirement, a huge capital requirement, and where you can scale up the volume of the service with very little additional cost, then you have a very high likelihood of success, provided you're, you're, you're providing a good quality, a good quality service. But I'll, I think I'll go back to what I said before. If you're looking for the highest chances of success, look for the biggest problem that needs to be solved, where solving that problem will, will create the most value. And by creating that value as a company, you will then have the right to extract or retain some of that, some of that value. Okay, I'm going to come to the audience very shortly, but just a quick one for you, Andrew. Oftentimes, you hear the argument being made, you know, that doing business within Africa is a bit more difficult than it is doing business with the rest of the world. This is one of the strongest arguments that the AFTA is making, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. The emergence of it, the introduction of it, it's obviously going to bring great gains to African companies, African economies. From where you sit as ZP, what do you see as being some of the strongest opportunities that people should look out for? Well, so I, I want to take us just one step back and come forward, just because I've been listening to the comments on the table. Without digital, you will fail in the 21st century. They didn't have an act which created a ministry called digitalization. That is because they realized that they need that infrastructure and they need the behaviors to make it work. After, after is a wonderful thing. I think it's just an affirmation of Kwame Nkrumah's Africa, which he said, it has to be a unification of all of Africa. The only thing is that in the 21st century, it will be done by players sitting in this room. It's a, the private sector is going to unify Africa into a Pan-African Africa. And AFTAC is just a platform that to some extent will make it happen because it's already happened. If you ask me, AFTAC happened, should have happened maybe 50 years ago. But fair enough, and it's going to force central bankers to have a new thought process. It's going to force other forms of other types of regulators to have a new thought process. Because everything that we're talking about in Africa, counterparties are doing that in Africa already. Do you see what I mean? But I think that if not for anything at all, look, just the, 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 the flower industry is over 60 billion. Ghana, sorry, Rwanda, Kenya, Ethiopia before we talk about the southern markets. That market alone means that if, if indeed AFTAC is what it is, then it's gonna open it up some more. But we're already shipping. We're already everything. We're already bringing these things into these markets. We're already paying for them. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking, what is the real after conversation about before I can answer you? Because if we're talking about free, free trade area and it's free, We've always had a brown plate, and it works. You see, it works for those who leverage it. It works for those who have sought to understand it. 
So I think after is just an affirmation of what our fathers should have done that they didn't do before. Now we need to go back and build that infrastructure that is digital to make it succeed. That is why when you're in New York, you can still get a yellow cab on Uber because it's infrastructure. Uber is an infrastructure. Airbnb is an infrastructure that allows you to take homes and rooms and to put on the platform. Do you see what I'm saying? I talk about remittance as well, probably Africa's largest remittance platform. Just by virtue of the fact that we built infrastructure. It is infrastructure. My good friends, the Yellow Boys, empty. It's infrastructure. It is infrastructure. So we need to think from an infrastructure perspective. It doesn't have to be a hard infrastructure. Like Barnell said, it's also a soft infrastructure. And we need to start seeing it that way. So that's my answer to that. Great, great thoughts there. We'll just come very quickly to the audience now, take a few questions. Um, I think the microphones are available to the left and the right side of the room. Um, as you were talking, I was listening and I'm, I'm excited about collaboration and partnership, which is building these companies. I'm wondering, does it have a role to play internally? Is it just about external collaboration and partnership? Or there is a room for internal partnership? and collaboration, as in departments, um, doing business, how do we help each other within to promote the company to be able to flourish outside? I don't know if that. Right, I think, I think it's a brilliant question. Maybe we'll take one more, two more. Yes. So we, Andrew, you, you'll take that question for me, if you just note that down. Um, we have time for just two more questions. Microphones are available. You can just put your hand up. Um, microphone will come to you. So should we do this now? Yes, we can. Okay. So look, I, I, like the, I like the statement, the question. I want to take it even two steps back. In this room, we need to challenge ourselves and say to ourselves, we're going to build an Africa for Africans. And when it starts from identifying that, okay, I mean, I, 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 I can collaborate with this company. I can teach them to give me what I want the way I want it. That company should also have a mindset that says, I'm keeping an open mind, and I'm not thinking the other company is arrogant, but it's a world-class organization, and it's going to make me a world-class organization. So in terms of collaboration, these are some of the things we did. Some of our partnerships, we, we did it just so we'll learn. We'll learn the game and be able to participate in the game. So in that same, even cross-departmental, sometimes we as leadership, must encourage that cross-departmental engagement with the hope that we will learn to be able to do our own game better. We, we, you see, Korea was intentional. Malaysia was intentional. Singapore was deliberate. We need to be deliberate in this room. It doesn't matter whether it's a multinational that came from abroad or it's a local entity that's about to rise. But let's just be intentional. The time has come for us to call guys from the other side of the river to come in. Let's just build the local ecosystems because as these local ecosystems is the value chain that will take us all to the other side. So I don't know if I've answered you, but I think it's not just departmental, it's an entire ecosystem and it's behaviors and it's deliberate. It's like these forums are going to create those deliberate attempts to make us great. Yes, please go ahead, Jerry. A few, few seconds, if you will. Uh, I'll, I'll make it brief. So I'll add to that that we start thinking about the partnership at the point when we're establishing the business. And I'm not talking about just the external partnerships with other companies. It's even in terms of ownership. No one founder can claim to have every single asset that they need to build their business. And I think this is one major deficiency we see with a lot of businesses. Everyone wants to chart their own path. They want to own the thing. They want to be the, the guy, the boss in the business. The be the you know the be all and end all. That is the start of the negative mindset that doesn't encourage collaboration. And what Andrew is saying is exactly right. The ecosystem. You know, with, within Injaro, there are two things, and I, I just wanted to mention this because I think every CEO in this room should do this. One, let us all make a part of our contribution to society to give some young people a chance. Hire people for national service, hire fresh grads, train them. It doesn't matter if they go somewhere else and go and work for someone else. You haven't lost it. It is going into the ecosystem. It will come back and help you. I've seen it happen. 
let us all let us all do this that's the first one the second one is if there's any service that you're buying from a foreign company make make up your mind that in the next five years you can find a local company and bring them up to that international standard so you can buy that service from a local company this is how we develop our ecosystem and the final one is let us have the ambition of Kwame Nkrumah again why is it we, why should we be in a situation where the multinational banks we have in Ghana are Nigerian but there's no multinational Ghanaian bank in Nigeria I'm going back to that big hairy audacious scary goal when to, well, we need to develop this mindset that when we are starting something it can be big it can be pan-african it can be global and until we think it we can never achieve it so I'm just throwing this out there some of us Maybe our journey is halfway done. I'm hoping there's some young people in the room who can pick up the mantle and, and move this forward because you can. You can. Thank you. Yes, we can. We'll take final comments now and then we'll bring this conversation to an end. Um, Mr. Corey, your final comments, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, touching the same subject as my final comments, and I should have actually mentioned it earlier about the partnerships and alliances. Uh, if we change our expectations, there's a lot of value in Africa. If we open up our horizon and look at it differently, there's huge, tremendous value. I'd like to share just a small example that just came to my situation. And it's a very important one. Uh, we uh, used to rely on bringing expatriate, uh, highly skilled technicians to certain specialized mining equipment. And we are facing a lot of problem with turnover. Uh, people don't want to stay, the living environment is not suitable, so it was very challenging. Until we realized one day that there's thousands of capable individuals in Ghana or Nigeria, and we, what we did was provide them an education program so they can take, elevate their skills or the, the competency level to the same level of a, of a German expatriate, and ultimately that individual became an ambassador, and we have a network today of technicians who are uh, our best uh, part salesmen. So it's all about changing the expectations. If we believe that only that culture can deliver what we're looking for, we're never going to find any value where you are. Uh, so I think that's very, very important, the mindset. If you open up and change your expectations, there's tremendous value in Africa. Thank you so much, Mr. Corey. I had someone say once that if we change the way we look at things, things we look at will change and that that sat strongly with me i cannot better explain the comments that you have just made mr muzamil your final comments sir for uh thanks yeah i think uh, one of the key points that i would want to stress is that there's still so much pot potential left in ghana for in terms of business you know that's currently not here and there's so much opportunity that's available and there's so much talent it's the owners of us as business owners to give the space for these innovative young uh, you know enterprising individuals to to feel free to put and pitch their ideas and provide them with all the resources and access that they need leverage on partnerships and relationships to support and incubate their business ideas and we have clearly seen business success over the last five years we have seen new ideas create multi-million dollar businesses purely because we pushed our creative minds to make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been an absolute masterclass. How about a resounding round of applause once again? Wow. And this is how we come to the end of day one as we reflect on the